Hey, this is H1, and we're going to be running it back with another episode talking about chess knowledge, chess wisdom, and chess understanding again. Today, we are going to be going over this Grandmaster game at the Olympiad, the event that just passed, but we can, get, we can gain a lot of lessons from that game. So that's why I wanted to go over it. Let's do it right quick. Let's, let's get into it. So this game, it started out with this move, E4, and then they did E5. When you see a move like E4 in chess, especially at a Grandmaster tournament, you already know there's either going to be fireworks or it's going to be a dud. It's going to be fireworks or a dud because a lot of Grandmasters, especially on a black side, they go, they go do the Berlin defense and then you already know it's going to be a very boring position. Or if white plays like the two knights um, variation, then you know it's going to be a very solid, slow moving position. Now, after this move E5, Knight to f3, attacking this pawn on e5. That's the purpose. Get that tempo. Black has to defend the pawn. They can either go like d6, but they decided to go knight to c6. And then after this move, knight to c6, bishop to c4 initiates the Italian game. Or you can call it the Guccico Piano, etc. What is the purpose of putting the bishop to c4 instead of b5? Well, that bishop is keeping an eye on that f7 pawn. And maybe we could do the fry liver by doing like knight to g5 if they do knight to f6. I don't know. I don't know. These grandmasters, they have all these secret openings. You never know. Bishop c5, d3, which is a very calm way on how to play the Italian game, not just doing the immediate c3, d4. And then we have this next move, knight to f6. And they just keep on developing in the position. Castle and king side d6 and then we have this move c3 in this position after c3 which is planning to do either d4 b4 and then b5 attack not knight or even trying to trap that bishop with b4 a4 in the position black is going to have to be careful and watch out for it but not immediately yet that's why they castled the king after castling we get this move h3 because usually Grandmasters do not like their knights to be pinned. So why not avoid this move bishop to g4, pin in this knight, and then we can't move that knight anymore. Activity is important. Activity is super important, especially when you're trying to find tactics to put the most pressure on the opponent to eventually win the game. After this move, h3, and then we have a5. A5 stops to move B4, and plus, now that bishop has a pocket on A7 where it can stay on this diagonal. What did white do here in this position? Well, they did another developing move because we still have a few pieces that we need to get activated. If your pieces don't have a job, if they don't have a purpose in a position, that is bad. Just like at your job, you have a purpose, like the manager decides where to put every employee. That's exactly how we should be playing chess. A5, rook to E1, bishop to E6, and so now we gotta decide on something. Now we gotta decide. When our opponent threatens a piece, we can capture the piece, we can move the piece out of danger, or we could just leave the piece right there and then do a better move. What did they decide? They actually decided to do this move, um, bishop to b5. Not saying that the other options don't work either, but they wanted to keep that bishop. I mean, grandmasters love their bishops, so why not keep the double bishop uh, advantage? Don't, and plus, and plus, let me just tell you this, in the Spanish game, in the Guccico Piano, that light score bishop is crucial to attacking the king, which you will see in a minute. After bishop b5, bishop to a7 and then we have this next move knight b to d2 you probably wondering right now okay don't we usually want to put the knight to c3 instead like why do we put the pawn to c3 we're not been doing the move b4 we haven't did the move d4 that pawn is going to be weak if that bishop ever like goes to like to a4 and, and etc what's the purpose of doing knight b to d2 well, this is a common maneuver, especially when you're playing the Guccico Piano. In the Spanish game, usually with these like uh, maneuvers with the Italian game, <laughs> so many names, but they, they kind of all have the same thing, especially with this knight on b1. Let's continue on with this. After knight b to d2, knight to e7, 
because black is planning on doing like c6, kicking that bishop, gaining more space on the queen side, and then putting that knight on a better square. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna strike in the center with the move d4. Why do we do d4? What's the purpose? Well, in chess, in every single game that you play, you want to control the center because whoever controls the center controls the game. And how do you control the game? Let me be more specific. When you control the center, you have more space. And when you have more space, you have more options to either attack the king side and the queen side. And you can cause weaknesses on your opponent's side so that you can put the most pressure on them to eventually make a mistake. Of course, with perfect chess, you know, you can't do nothing about it. But good thing we are facing humans all the time, all right? We're not facing computers. Uh, Magnus Carlsen isn't a computer. And when you're facing a human, that human's gonna make a mistake. It might be minuscule, but it's still a mistake. D4, knight to G6, and that knight could be going to the F4 square. What do we do about that? Do we just stop that? Or like, what, what did this opponent do here? Well, white didn't even like care about it at all. That's why they did this move, a bishop to A4. And then we have this move, knight to H5, targeting that square one more time. And then what do you think here? What's a common maneuver that we do with this knight on d2? Do y'all remember? If you know your Gushiko Piano, you probably already seen this maneuver already, but let me show you if this is the first time. You put that knight to f1. Why exactly? Well, that knight has a few squares to go. It can go to e3, it can go to g3, and then eventually, you know, that, that main square on f5 could be hit. And when you got a knight on f5, that knight is like a knife. And what do I mean? That knight can sacrifice itself on g7. It could be a potential attacker on the king that is castled on the king side, which is really good. We want attackers on the king side. And there's only two types of attacks that we could do on a castled king. There's, pawn, there's a pawn storm attack and there's a peace attack. And with the knight on f5, we could get that peace attack going with the sacrifice on the g7 square or checks on e7 you never know what's going to happen in chess we just have to be imaginative you got to be very creative when you're playing this game after knight h to f4 knight g3 progressing on with this game and this could just be theory that they know and that they went over with previous grandmaster games because that's theory um theory is just grandmaster games in the past that is remodeled for modern times. Knight to g3, c6, eventually. That's why we did this move, bishop to a4. And then we have bishop c2 because b5 is gonna be happening pretty soon. Queen d7, and this queen d7 move, do not be deceived about queen d7. Sacrifices on this h3 square can happen. And that knight is on f4, and that knight on f4, just like the knight on f5 if we got our knight to f5 is a knife too so that knight could sacrifice itself on h3 or g2 and we have to calculate all these sacrifices each move since we allowed our opponent to have a knight on the f4 square and when you see a move like queen d7 you gotta worry you gotta worry about it and that's why white did the move to punt that bishop on e6 making sure there's no sacrifices happening here bishop to f5 now there's not any major threats. If knight takes on h3, g takes on h3, everything is good. Everything is fine, baby. <laughs> like, there's no attack. Because when you're attacking a king, you need at least like three to four to five pieces. You cannot attack a king with one piece. That's why we develop pieces in the opening. Because if we attack our opponent's king with one piece, it's not gonna be a successful attack. You're not gonna get checkmate and you're gonna lose the game really fast. So you gotta be very strategic. After knight to f5, f6, um, solidifying the center pawn, and then we have this move knight five to h4. Knight five to h4 here in this position. Maneuvering pieces. After knight, h, uh, knight five to h4, <laughs> it's very confusing to say that every single time. Queen to f7. And then we have knight takes on g6. Just taking pieces, releasing some of the tension that's on the king's side. Bishop, wait a minute. 
what? After knight takes on g6, we have this move. Knight takes on g6, and then bishop to e3. Making sure that once we take, or if we push up, that bishop isn't gonna be eyeing our f2 pawn. And our opponent put this battery on the f5 for a reason. So when we're playing chess, we gotta think about our opponent's plans, think about their imaginary like attacking systems that could happen, and we gotta think about our plans. But it's, it's beneficial for you to think about your opponent plans a little bit more because you don't want to be caught up with some tactic that you, you say that you didn't see, but you didn't even ask the you didn't even ask the right questions. After bishop to e3, bishop b8 because black is still trying to attack, and then we have this next move of b3, very solid. After b3, b5, gaining queenside control, a4 because we don't want to just let our opponent gain a lot of control on the queen side with no um, with no worry. And then we have this move, bishop c7. After bishop c7, a takes on b5. One of the f one of the first captures that happened here. C takes on b5. And then we have this strong move that we're gonna do, locking up the center with d5. And now that bishop on c7 looks like another pawn. Because, listen here, they did b8, they did d uh, c7. That bishop cannot go back to like b6 because we could just take it. And now this is an initiative move because we are attacking this bishop on e6. We're gaining the center squares. It's not exactly winning yet, but it's a step into the right direction. After d5, bishop to d7, protecting that pawn, and plus putting the bishop on a good square. And then we have this next move, c4, because we want to push that pawn down. There's a future that white is seeing here. And this is why it's really good to learn your pawn structures, to learn your uh, your pawn chains, which direction you should be attacking. You should be attacking with the direction your pawns are going, etc. There's a future here that could happen where we can get a protected pass pawn with moves like c5, d takes on c5, bishop takes on c5. We have a protected pass pawn, which could win us a end game very well. If you don't know about your protected pass pawn lessons, hey, put it in the comments down below if you want me to talk about protected pass pawns, uh, especially the end games that you can win very easily with. Uh, um, with that, c4, and then we have our next move, queen e7, queen d2, rook f to b8, because they are the strongest on the queen side, and then we have rook e to d1 putting more pressure, uh, putting the rook behind this pawn because eventually we want that pawn to, that pawn is going to be a pass pawn and we want that pawn to go forward so that we can promote it. And it's actually really good to, you know, already get our rook set up behind it because we want our rooks behind our pass pawns eventually. So after this move, rook f, uh, rook e to d1, queen f8, and then rook a2, after rook a2, b4. Locking up the uh, queen side, but now they kind of created themselves a backwards pawn on a5. But is that enough to get an advantage here? Let's find out. Let's see. After b4, knight to e1, inaccuracy, but nobody plays a perfect game every single game. a4, and then we have knight to d3. Making sure our pieces are getting to the right squares. We don't want to just keep our knight on e1. We put the knight on e1 to go somewhere else into the position where it could be more useful. So that's why we did this move knight to d3. And then our opponent did this move f5. Opening up the position. Now it's going crazy. There's a lot of tension in this position. There's this tension on this a pawn, which, I mean, they could do a3 and make their own protective pass pawn. But this pawn on b4 is pretty weak, and we can actually capture that pawn right now if we really wanted to. But now we're gonna have to calculate what happens if we capture that pawn and then our opponent does this move f4, which is trapping that bishop on the e3. So we gotta be really careful and calculate, visualize the best moves here, especially if we're playing a very strong player because they're not gonna miss moves like this. I mean, if f4 wasn't there trapping the bishop, that we don't want our opponent to start a attack against our king. So what does white do? White does this move f3, protecting that pawn, and now that bishop won't be trapped. If f4 happens, bishop to f2. 
After f3, f takes on e4 because black wants to open up the position. f takes on e4, knight f4. What is that knight doing here? And there's a lot of, there's like one more inaccuracy that's gonna happen, which was c5. I guess the computer wanted, instead of the move c5, what is, what is it gonna say? Instead of the move c5, I guess they wanted the move knight takes on h3, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Instead of the move c5, they wanted, um, yeah, knight takes on f4, just get rid of that problem. But we have this move c5. Not a, not a detrimental move, but, at, when you get stronger, and this is like in any sport, you got to be very precise. And that's the difference between like super grandmasters and normal grandmasters, which is kind of crazy for me to even say. But super grandmasters are precise and consistent. They don't miss a thing. And so, yeah, of course, we got that little inaccuracy, but the game continues. It's not a losing move. You know, it is a losing move is this knight takes on e <laughs> knight takes on d3. Why is it losing? Why is it losing? Well, let's figure out what happens here. After knight takes on d3, bishop takes on d3 <laughs> because we want that bishop activated. D takes on c5. And then we have this fascinating move. I'm going to give you all a second to find it. We got this fascinating move. And actually, let's analyze this position. What's going on here? That a pawn has constant threat uh, has a constant threat on b3. But remember, like if if this exchange didn't happen, then white could have did something. Like they could have took that pawn, and then plus if they would have just took that pawn on b3, it's a double isolated pawns, and they're pretty weak. So moves like rook takes on a a rook takes on a a rook b1, you're gonna take the pawns back um, pretty easily. And you might be thinking, well, what what happens after bishop a4? Well, bishop c4, you, you're gonna take the pawn's gonna get recaptured no matter what. So it's not really exactly a free pawn. Our bishops are doing a really good job. They're angling on both sides. This bishop is keeping a constant threat on c5. Their bishops aren't doing anything at all, especially this. Notice. Notice. And you probably got to rewind. But that bishop went to b8 to c7. The role of that bishop is non-existent. <laughs> it's, it's not really doing anything. At least on d6, it would be doing something better. But even at d6, it's going to look like another pawn. And that bishop on d7 is doing some work too. And that rook on b8 wants to do something, but that b3 pawn is keeping it from pushing their b4 pawn. And that's why we got this fascinating move here. And you got to look out for all the checks and you got to look out for all the threats for you to even find a move like this. What forcing move can you do here? And forcing moves is checks, captures, and threats. d6. What happens after d6? There's a lot of threats here. Bishop is attacking that, a pawn is attacking that, c7 uh, bishop. Bishop can go to c4 check, and there's a lot of tactics to look out for. It is losing, but we have to play consistently good moves. After d6, bishop to b6, and then we have this next move, bishop to c4, check. What happens? And you might be wondering like, okay, what, what happens if bishop just takes on d6? Why can't we do this? Or why can't we do queen takes on d6? It's attacked by two pieces. Well, bishop c4 releases the battery on the d file, which is amazing if you think about it. Like after the king moves, queen takes on d6. We get an extra piece. We win the game very easily. Now, that's why um, they could have captured that pawn and instead did this move of bishop to b6. Bishop c4 was the next move that was played here. And then after bishop c4, king h8, rook f1, attacking that queen. The queen has to move somewhere and notice that every single move is a threat. When you get the initiative, don't release the initiative. Don't just do a slow move like rook to b2. Don't do an idiotic, stupid move like that. No, keep on threatening stuff so that your opponent has to do something about it. And usually the keep an initiative move, the forcing move is the right move in chess, especially when you got a lead like this. After rook to f1, queen to c8, you might think is a reasonable move because maybe there's some like potential drawing options, but this is actually an inaccuracy. This is actually a little mistake because we have this fascinating move 
a move that probably you won't think about if you wasn't um, thinking about like threats, bishop to h6. What happens after bishop to h6? If you keep the bishop on h6 and do a move like rook to, let me see, after bishop h6, if you do a move like, um, oh crap, my bad. If you do a move like a bishop to h6, if you keep the bishop right there, you can sacrifice on the square. Like if black does queen g8 or queen, <laughs> black even, I mean, the, the top engine move is queen g8 for something, for some reason. Um, but even with the queen going to g8, the best move is still like bishop takes on g No, wait a minute. I got that mistake. Okay, my bad, my bad. If the best move by the engine is queen to g8, but we just take the queen, obviously. If black doesn't do anything, and they do a move like bishop to d8, uh, shoot, rook f8 is checkmate. If they really don't do anything, if they do this move like rook to a7, I mean, easily, we could do like this um, sacrifice on g7, bring the queen in, and then get get like a, a, a constant checkmate already. Bishop takes, king takes, queen g5, king has to move back, only square. That's checkmate in three. So black can't do the wrong move at all. This is this is a horrible position. Like they can't just do a very simple move because that's that's the checkmate in three. That's why black did this move. Capture. Probably the only best move to stay in the game is to capture and make white prove that they are winning in this position. But we sacrificed a piece for a reason to get the queen over here. And realize something, when you're attacking, you got to realize the attackers and the defenders in the position. There are three attackers right now with a naked king. The king has no defenders. All their pieces is on the queen side in this position. And so after queen takes on h6, queen f8, you know, threatening a trade because this is the only way how to survive this. Every other move is trash. And this move is trash too, but at least they're trying to continue on with the game. Rook takes on f8, obviously, taking the free queen with the rook. And then after rook takes back, this last move made the opponent resign. And the last move was rook to f2. After rook to f2, black had to resign. Black had to resign. There's too many threats here. And guess what? There's mate, <laughs> there is mate in five moves, weirdly enough. There's mate in five moves. And rook F takes on f2 makes the mate in four moves because after rook takes on f2, king takes on f2, um, rook to g8, rook to g8, queen f6, rook to g7, queen f8, rook to g8, queen takes on g8, checkmate. Because of that bishop on c4. Don't forget about... You remember that bishop that we saved with the move like bishop to b5? That bishop became a very vital attacker. That's why when you're playing the Guchka piano, the Italian game, um, Spanish game, that that bishop is your friend. That's your, that's your baby brother. You got to protect your baby brother or your baby sister. Even better. Like, you got to protect your baby sister. Right? Anyway, it was a good game a good lesson for all of us to to learn from and hey keep on fighting till the end staying focused in chess and in real life too hopefully you learn something put in the comments what you want to see next peace